Hello, Russian Hour on air. Today, in the fourth episode of our Litvinenko Inquiry, Eric Krauss, a renowned strategist and expert on Russia, talks about the case of Alexander Litvinenko, followed by shocking revelations from a well-known U.S. lawyer, Emmanuel Zeltzer. Eric, the economist in a recent article entitled Living with Putin again calls the Russian government's behavior egregious and imputes to it the murder of Alexander Litvinenko. Just like that. No facts, no respect to Reynolds' points, legally speaking, to impartiality or accuracy. What is it? Is it a presumption of guilt, lack of professionalism, or just pure and deliberate libel? I think it's fairly simple. I think The Economist is a propaganda organ of Whitehall, the same way that The Financial Times is very much that, The Washington Post of Washington. Um, the, there is a certain naivete in some of, my, some of the Russian correspondents who seem to believe that just because Soviet press was propagandistic and uh, lied to forward the interests of its masters, the Western press is somehow less uh, propagandistic. It's not. It's just working for a different set of masters. Um, and The Economist has been systematically wrong about Russia since 98. 98, The Economist thought that Russia was going to break down into four pieces. Inflation was going to 10,000 percent. The economy was going to collapse. Uh, none of it happened. If you follow their track record over the following years, they have been systematically wrong. Well, interestingly, Andrei Lugovoy, Britain's chief suspect in Litvinenko murder, has recently undergone a lie detector test by British experts, which proved him innocent. The test has been widely reported in Russia, but so far has had practically no coverage in the British media. Why? Uh, because the British media is not particularly interested in the truth in this matter. This is a useful stick with which to beat uh, Vladimir Putin uh, in, in Western media. Everyone knows, certainly those in power know, that uh, Putin had no, nothing to do with the death of Litvinenko. Um, he had nothing to gain. Uh, there are other people who had a great deal to gain, and they're the ones who were certainly responsible for the death of somebody who had told all the secrets he knew ten years previously. The entire drama was stage managed by Boris Berezovsky. Berezovsky got him out of Russia. Um, he served Berezovsky very well for a number of years, but he was becoming a liability. He told everything he knew. He was pushing, hitting Berezovsky for more money. Berezovsky was trying to cut him loose. So Litvinenko was beginning to freelance um, and trying to sell his security credentials or what he knew or who he knew to various shadowy parties. And he was becoming a, a liability to Berezovsky. Plus, it was a wonderful way to attack the Russian government very successfully for Berezovsky. It was just on the eve of Putin's departure for a European summit. Uh, and Berezovsky knew that the Western press was not going to question that however transparent, however obvious the setup was, the journalists were going to believe it because it served their interest. It served the story that they were trying to tell. If you can pay for a good enough PR form, firm and enough good lawyers, you can get refuge in, in the UK um, as, as long as you're not doing anything against what they perceive to be British interests. They'll be very understanding about your issues with the Russian government. Um, the US courts would be more difficult to manipulate because there, it is a less centralized system because you have state courts, you have federal courts, you have judges who have a great deal of independence. So I would think that this would probably be a, a better uh, venue for um, getting Mr. Berezovsky on some of the criminal acts he is purported to have uh, engaged in. And there is a, an extradition treaty between uh, the UK and the US so that if he were found guilty of or if he were simply credibly accused of criminal acts um, in the US then theoretically he could be extradited um, from the UK. 
It is, perhaps, no surprise that Emmanuel Zeltzer, an American lawyer for Mr. Berezovsky's late business partner, Badri Patakatsishvili, takes his fight against the UK-based oligarch to a US court. But it's the element of murder mystery that makes this case both astonishing and rather disturbing. I've known Boris since 1995, as I was a personal lawyer and a friend of his partner, Badri Patakatishvili. Naturally, I used to communicate with Berezovsky often. I participated in his meetings with Badri and others connected to their business. My relationship with Boris changed radically after Badri's death, when significant evidence emerged to the effect that Mr. Berezovsky and Badri's ex-wife, Ina Gudevadze, were involved in his death. Some in the media portray Badri as second fiddle to Berezovsky. More so, he's sometimes blamed for Boris's crimes, as if they were in it together. This is neither correct nor fair. I knew Badri for 16 years. I was his lawyer, advisor and friend. I defended his interests while he was alive, and now I want to take this opportunity to do the same posthumously. In the West, Badri was widely known as a high-level and talented businessman, investor, owner of a number of progressive-minded media outlets in post-Soviet countries and in the West. After the year 2000, he became a fully-fledged oligarch, the wealthiest man in Georgia and one of the wealthiest in the former Soviet Union. Sadly, few remember now that Badri donated most of his income to worldwide charities, schools, hospitals, science institutes, and research for treating cancer and AIDS. Badri also donated large amounts to the Georgian Patriarch on a regular basis. He was practically the only one funding hospitals for children with leukemia and orphanages in Georgia. He gave more than a million dollars to the Foundation for Victims of the 9-11 World Trade Center attack. Badri helped fund the 175-ton monument called To the Struggle Against World Terrorism by the sculptor Zurab Tseretelli that was given to the U.S. on the fifth anniversary of the 9-11 tragedy. Badri was the chairman of the Georgian National Olympic Committee and a board member of dozens of charities worldwide, including the Perez Peace Center of the Israeli president, whom Badri and I met a number of times. Indeed, Badri had been a 50-50 partner with Berezovsky for 10 years. In 2005, however, Badri became weary of his partner's tricks, political ambitions and enormous spending of joint cash to fund absurd revolutions in Russia, Georgia and elsewhere. Their relationship began to deteriorate dramatically. In late 2005, Badri told Boris of his intention to terminate their partnership and to carry on with his business on his own. Boris was outraged. Without Badri's money, he wouldn't be able to continue funding his insane ideas of power seizure in post-Soviet countries. Nevertheless, Badri wouldn't change his mind. In early 2006, they signed a so-called economic divorce that terminated his partnership with Boris. Presently, Boris is trying to prove that the partnership termination contract was just a fiction to deceive the Kremlin. This is a lie and Boris knows it. Why have Russia's attempts to extradite Berezovsky from the UK proven unsuccessful? Firstly, some British circles who believe closer ties between Russia and the UK would hurt them economically or politically hold on to their old view that Boris still has some influence or authority. They keep on using him as a smear machine to attack the Kremlin. Secondly, there's not enough determination in Moscow. In political terms, Boris is a criminal who's been convicted by the court of a competent jurisdiction. He wasn't convicted for attempting an overthrow or for anti-government propaganda or any other crime considered political in nature. Boris was convicted for plain swindling and embezzlement. Indeed, there is no agreement on mutual extradition between Russia and the UK. But I believe that the UK, a case law pioneer, a jurisdiction with a strongly developed judicial system, actually undermines its reputation 
by essentially sheltering a fugitive swindler and thief from justice in his own country. Doing that for the sake of some lobbyists, for certain interest groups who enjoy his tricks, saying when you look at that cheeky rascal, is certainly not worth it. Russia should demonstrate legally that the UK made a judicial mistake by formally reviewing Russia's request to extradite Berezovsky without any regard to criminal charges he faced and sentences handed down against him. The UK courts are guided by the great concept of presumption of Berezovsky's innocence. This concept mistakenly ensured him political asylum in the UK. If we look deeper into this and review this matter in a non-formal manner, it becomes obvious he was granted asylum with regards to charges against him relating to events of the early 1990s. But in fact, all the recent requests to extradite him are based on Berezovsky's crimes, confirmed by sentences in legal force since 2007 and 2009. They have nothing to do with politics. I believe my fellow experts in the Ministry of Justice and Russian President's office should cooperate with British and American legal specialists to prepare a new and comprehensive Berezovsky file. One consistent with British and American legislation, including case law and Western business ethics. They should use this file to initiate new proceedings in the UK. It should be an ordinary British court hearing with witnesses, documents, evidence and, most importantly, clear and professional argumentation in compliance with British procedure. This is the only way to help the British court take a comprehensive look at extraditing Berezovsky and consider all the evidence, testimonies and legally accurate arguments where Berezovsky's political asylum will be nothing more than an element of his defense, rather than an absolute presumption of his innocence, construed as a license to kill, as they say in the U.S. There is one more important legal fact. Russian law enforcement bodies are not alone in seeking Berezovsky. In July 2007, the Federal Court of Brazil issued warrants to arrest Berezovsky, Kia Jurabshin and Nojan Bedrud, co-founders of Media Sports Investments and several board members of the Corinthian Sports Club. They are all accused of laundering money through buying and selling footballers. Federal attorneys Silvio Luis Martins de Oliveira and Rodrigo de Grande told the Brazilian court the transactions are carried out with the use of numerous offshore accounts which have the single and well-known intention of distancing the investor and the illicit origin of the resources from their final destination. In this case, the purchase and sale of players. Money laundering has become an extremely sensitive issue in the post-9-11 world, both in the USA and the UK. Money laundering finances terrorism, so crimes related to money laundering are considered particularly dangerous. This clause in the indictment should become a focal point in the extradition request because it will put the UK under serious international and public pressure. Concealing a swindler and a thief would have been enough in itself, but Boris and his lawyers managed quite smartly and skillfully to attach a political tint to this. Money laundering is on a different level. A crime that aids and abets global terrorism is much more difficult to wrap in a sheepskin of political refugee in discord with the Kremlin, as it were. Boris is neither a political refugee nor a dissident. He used to be a Kremlin insider and made a great fortune due to the corruption of the Yeltsin regime. He became a dissident when his swindling and thievery was revealed and proven. 
This needs to be presented, clearly and in a legally competent way, to the British judicial system. July 9th marks eight years since the assassination of Forbes editor Paul Khlebnikov, who advocated Russian independence from a corrupt oligarchy of the 1990s. In his time, Paul wrote a sharply critical book about Berezovsky, Godfather of the Kremlin. Despite the fact that Boris can control himself, he would shrivel when he even heard the name of Paul Klebnikov. Once, when someone mentioned Klebnikov, Boris burst into such a foul-mouthed tirade that, given ladies were present, my colleagues and I had to simply drag him into another room and calm him down. Well, true to say, he apologized upon his return. There is no ample proof for that, though, and there won't be unless this case is taken to court, at least in Russia. In my opinion, the libel suit filed by Boris against Forbes magazine was legally absurd and factually nonsensical. In my time, I told him this more than once. He's perfectly aware of this, too. In the current Berezovsky versus Roman Abramovich case, Boris babbed. He actually admitted his suit against Forbes was based on false allegations. The difference between UK and US libel laws is that in the US, speech and press freedoms are protected by the First Amendment to the Constitution. Great Britain is a nominal monarchy and there is no constitution there, which means that while in our libel courts the plaintiff must prove what was said about him in the press is not true, it's the opposite in Britain. Burden of proof lies with the defendant which means publishers should prove their innocence and that the information published is true. That's why the UK is known in legal circles as a jurisdiction of defamation tourism, where rich men like Boris Abramovich go to accuse media of slander and having won the case, reaffirm the ruling of the Royal British Court in other countries, the USA in particular. This practice was discontinued in our country in 2010 when the US Congress passed a bill prohibiting US courts from acknowledging foreign libel verdicts, should such verdicts restrict the constitutional rights and liberties and the press. Strictly speaking, it's not me who is judging Berezovsky. I am just one of the lawyers in the case against Berezovsky at the Supreme Court of the State of New York. The case is about Boris being an accomplice in the murder of Badri Patakatishvili. The suit was filed by several members of the Patakatishvili family and some legal entities affected by his death. According to suit materials, Berezovsky and Badri's ex-wife Inu Gudavadze criminally conspired to kill Badri to seize control of his money and possessions. The suit says that at 5.45 p.m. on February 12, 2008, Badri met Berezovsky in his Westminster office at 7 Downing Street. According to the files, Berezovsky put sodium fluoroacetate into Badri's cognac. This lethal poison is called the death serum. It has long been used by secret services, including the KGB. It has no color or taste, and it is almost impossible to detect in the body at autopsy. It causes extensive infarction, coma, and eventually death. The preliminary autopsy report reveals that Badri died of a stroke, but the final results have yet to be made public. The causes of his death are still under investigation. Badri felt it coming. The suit confirms he told his friends several times he may be murdered by Gudavadze and Berezovsky. But he took this in his stride. When I lost the elections in Georgia, I let my friends down and became a political albatross around their necks, he would say. If they decide they will all be better off without Badri, who am I to judge? As the case is in process, Law prohibits me from discussing its details. But I consulted Badri as a personal lawyer and legal advisor from 1995 till the day he died. Here is why, assisted by other former friends of Badri's, I have collected evidence and testimonies to prove Berezovsky and Gudavadze's involvement in the murder. Do we get it right that you have documents to prove your accusations? 
We have already handed some documents over to the court, while others will be submitted in due course. One of the most interesting documents in this case is the agreement struck by Ina Gudovadze and Boris Berezovsky, which divides Badri's inheritance between the two of them in equal shares. The agreement was signed on February the 25th, 2008, three days before Badri's body was buried. In other words, they must have struck the agreement when he died. Berezovsky calls himself Badri's closest friend. Gudovadze was his wife. If your next of kin died, would you negotiate dividing his inheritance even before the funeral rather than grieve over him? Would you do it all in a business-like manner? What if this agreement had been composed even before Badri died? This is awful. This is awful because the one who composed it had to know for sure that Badri would die and, moreover, die very shortly. But Badri was healthy and sound. Therefore, only those who caused his death could have been aware of his imminent demise. The case contains materials and testimony that prove the existence of a draft agreement between Berezovsky and Gudovadze dating from January 2008. That is two weeks prior to Badri's death. This is very strong but indirect proof. My fellow colleagues and I strongly believe that the court will establish the guilt of Berezovsky and Gudovadze. Berezovsky is undoubtedly a very dangerous person, so finding witnesses and persuading them to give testimony is very hard. Moreover, we have had to take precautions to protect witnesses from the kind of thing that happened to Badri. Andrei Lugovoy, Britain's chief suspect in the Litvinenko case, recently passed a polygraph test that shows he is innocent of the charge. The test was conducted by leading independent UK lie detector experts. Have you heard of this? What are your thoughts on the test? A lie detector is my so-called intimate friend, as I used it tens or even hundreds of times. But the results of a lie detector test are not admissible in either US or English courts. Results are considered quite unreliable and, in addition, may adversely affect a jury verdict. Despite all this, we submit polygraph tests in extrajudicial and pretrial proceedings. I've employed it a lot under agreement with the prosecutor's office, providing that they cease prosecution if my client passes the test. The very fact of Lugovoy taking this test with confidence and on top of it, passing it impeccably, is at least indirect proof of his innocence. What makes this story even more peculiar is the supposed polygamy of Mr. Patakatsishvili. If the authenticity of his marriage with a certain Olga Safanova in Russia is confirmed, as well as the alleged separation agreement between him and his partner Ina, dated 1994, which, perhaps, may have rendered her claims for a part of inheritance null and void. And on top of that, there's a mystery as to why his son, David, receives only a tiny share of his dad's inheritance. Well, it's truly a mystery inside an enigma, which, unlike what the saying suggests, goes way beyond Russia. Russian Hour has no independent knowledge of the facts alleged in Mr. Zeltzer's complaint and is offering Mr. Berezovsky a fair opportunity to comment on the allegations. Russian Hour values its neutrality and reputation for objectivity and independence and hereby issues a standing invitation to Mr. Berezovsky to be interviewed and present his side of the story.